Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by El Catterton managing partners, Michael Ferrello and John Owsley. In addition to investments in consumer brands across almost every category, Al Catterton has been heavily involved in fitness space, investing in Equinox, ClassPass, Peloton, Tonal, and many others. In this episode, we take a deep dive into the future of fitness, including COVID's impact on gyms and studios, the growth of connected fitness, and the potential for tech companies like Apple and Amazon to get involved. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing over at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Michael, John, welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's like to be on. I'm, I'm excited to chat with you both today. And I think to kick things off, could you just introduce yourselves and share a little bit about your roles at Al Catterton? Sure, sure. This is Michael Farello and the firm Al Catterton. Uh, you may know we have a we have about twenty billion dollars under management. We've been investing for over thirty years, though neither John nor I have been doing it that long. Uh, and the firm's always been focused on consumer growth. So we focus on categories that we believe have real tailwind, independent of the macro environment, and underpinned by consumer trends on how and where and and what consumers are going to be spending on. And within the firm, John and I co-manage our growth fund. And the, the simple definition of the growth fund is when we're investing between 10 million and 75 million of equity, uh, we do that. And our colleagues and other funds focus on the larger investments. So we're a little biased, or at least I am. I think, uh, I think we're working with some of the more interesting companies at this stage. Uh, but certainly, uh, we, learn from, we learn from the larger companies in the firm as well and, and vice versa. Um, for the sake of this conversation, you know, I talked to both you offline a little bit, um, of interest to us and the audience is really the investments that you've made, um, in the fitness and wellness space. I think from Equinox, Pure Bar, ClassPass to, uh, Peloton, Hydro, Tonal, more recently, I think maybe a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, Icon Health and Fitness, uh, investing heavily in the fitness space. Can you just talk about uh, Al Catterton's interest and focus on fitness and kind of what you're seeing in that space? Uh, yeah, sure. Hey, it's, it's John. Um, you know, as Michael said, so first of all, we love, you know, just sort of state, it's probably obvious from, <laughs> from everything we've done. But we love the fitness category, and 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 we think about it like that. We think about it like a category. As Michael, as Michael mentioned and alluded to, I mean, we're we think of ourselves as sort of trend-based investors. You know, seeking out those categories where you know, consumers are spending a disproportionate of their time and money and and frankly mind share uh, in those areas. And uh, you know, and whether it's in you know in-person classes, right, which were a, a big, which were and we believe will be a big part of the sort of communal fitness journey, whether it's individual pursuits, kind of in and out of the in and out of the house. So you know, whether it be something like cycling outside, or whether it be something inside like connected fitness, you know, we just there's just a tremendous movement um, uh, into the space and into the category, and so we really see tons of opportunity in all different areas. And I mean, I think that you know the general evolution of folks, you know, realizing the benefits, not just the physical, but the mental, the emotional, and all of all of the other aspects that that come from you know from from engaging in fit behavior, and 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 you know, and as a subsector, you alluded to Joe of the of the of the sort of greater health and wellness category, which we're, you know, as, if you look across our portfolio, you know, you'll see food and beverage and supplements and active wear and, and things that, that surround sort of the health and wellness lifestyle, um, which, which we're heavily involved in and, and fitness is a big part of that. Absolutely. And I think the category, you know, as you talked about, there's so many different pieces and in, in different ways that you could kind of dissect health from wellness to well-being to fitness. And specifically in this case, when you look at brick and mortar, the industry has kind of evolved from just the health club or, you know, big box gym or high end health club like Equinox into boutique studios that have accelerated the category, uh, you know, heading into this year, obviously class pass raised a big round that valued them at over a billion dollars. And then we had COVID hit. And the implications are vast. There's really no way to predict the future. But when this is happening, as it happened, as it evolved, 
How did you guys, how does that change your thinking with respect to the brick and mortar space? And, and how are you thinking about gyms and studios as we get into now the back half, seven, eight months of the pandemic and going into 2021? Yeah, well, we've been spending a lot of time, as you would imagine, trying to figure out what behaviors consumers have, have exhibited over these past seven or eight months are temporal and which ones are really fundamental longer term changes, right? And, 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 and are, is it a shift in the trends that we think about? Uh, and so when you think about fitness and the areas that you mentioned, the three that we've been most engaged on, connected fitness, which is obviously thriving in this environment, but the boutique fitness and the personal training, the other two have had real challenges, one, one tied obviously to the boutique and the other tied to the gyms. And so as, as we've talked to consumers and, and we have a chance to do that on a, on a monthly basis, we do a lot of survey work, it's clear that there's still a desire to get back in some form, that as much as uh, more consumers are turned on to connected fitness, they're doing more at home, we think there'll likely be some type of hybrid. So as we, as we look at studios coming back, and you see it already in some other geographies, right? We've invested in, in Asia and Europe. And as you see those economies come back on and the closures reopen, some of the studios are coming back with lower capacity per class, some with shorter classes and greater frequency. Uh, but the key for both them and the personal trainers is that in some way they integrate with the home workout experience. And, and we've seen that via class pass, by the way, during these seven or eight months where class pass enabled instructors in the studios to be able to still hold classes with their members at home, still use class pass as the billing platform to do that, to create more of a, a holistic experience. And whether that, whether that consumer is now working out at home or whether they're working out at the studio, there's a chance for that instructor to participate in both. And I think you're going to see that type of creativity where it becomes more relationship based. And that'll be true with the trainers. It'll tr be true with the instructors at the, at the studios. Sure. I think one thing that we've talked a little bit about, you, you basically have two sides of this, right? You have the, the gyms and studios themselves, and they're talking about this omni-channel future. And that's kind of what you're hitting mm -hmm. on is like, you have to integrate with what's going on at home or outside the studio. And then from the kind of member perspective, you have them, you know, maybe they're still going to the gym, but they're just going less frequently. So there's some type of breakdown between how often they're exercising at home and maybe the gym or studio is not at the center of the fitness experience as it, as it once was. Um, does the, I think it's become a kind of a buzzword to say omni-channel. Does that, what does that mean to you? How do you think about those two things, the in-studio and outside of the studio integrating and, and maybe who's doing it well from what you're saying? Well, I think the ones that have been doing it well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't speak to a whole chain yet, interestingly enough. I would speak to some of the individual franchisees and some of the concepts or some of the individual instructors that, that have figured out a way how to maintain that relationship, right? And again, they, some of those that are doing it via, via class pass. What I can tell you from the other side is we've had some of those same studios reaching out to the tonals and the hydros, trying to figure out is there a way for them to even integrate some of their content into those into those machines, right, and into their platforms. So I'd say it's early days. There's no one that I would say is doing it particularly well at scale, but you see a lot of experimentation going on and a lot of conversation going on, all trying to respond to exactly what you described, Joe, how, how that consumers are likely to have more of this hybrid experience, right, and balance more evenly between what they're doing at home and what they're doing in the studio or the gym and what they're doing outside. Yeah, it's so interesting and really, really hard to predict to your point. And I think in the very early days of figuring out like how this all plays out, I think on the flip side of the brick and mortar obviously has been the boom in connected fitness. We've kind of talked about it as the the workout from home gold rush, obviously Peloton now, you know, $35 billion company. So the idea of bundling content and equipment is one that has taken off and kind of been proven out and validated. And now everybody's getting on board. Um, what's the thinking been at Al Catterton about these investments? Obviously there's, you know, early Bax Peloton, then Hydro, Tonal, Icon. Uh, how are you thinking about the space and, and those investments in particular? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, I think it's interesting. I mean, you know, not to not to be too simplistic or to go too far back, but but to your point, right? You know, we've been we've been watching the fitness space for for years, and and you know, and and thankfully, we've also been significant consumers of um, of the fitness space. And I think you know, historically, right? I mean, you said it, Joe. You know, at, you alluded to it that at home fitness was just sort of you know it was boring. It was unenergizing. And, you know, I think we started to see that start to change with things like, I'd say early on with things like P90X and, and what Tony Horton did for sort of bringing some enthusiasm uh, and some excitement to the at-home workout experience. And then, you know, that's what really originally got us excited about Peloton is we had seen how, uh, you know, sort of at-home fitness could be better and it could be engaging and it could be uh, more like being in in a class, but but then Peloton came along and took it to to, to just a totally different level, and actually brought that class uh, into your you know into your house, and and so you know for us that was just this incredible innovation in an area that we've been focusing on for 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 a pretty long time, and 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 solving a real problem out there with with figuring out how to make something convenient. Um, but also fun, exciting, and addictive. And so we, we love the nature of Peloton as a result of that. And 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 as we look at things like hydro and tonal, you know, we see hydro and tonal as pushing that envelope. Um, you know, taking kind of what you know, doing the kinds of things that Peloton did, and pushing that even further. You know, uh, in, you know, different and 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 uh, and exciting content, right? Content slightly different than what Peloton was doing, uh, and in a different format. And then increasingly, you know, we're sort of seeing the the elements of this sort of extraordinary hard, hardware and software evolution that is that is taking that in home experience and, and bringing it up to another level and allowing for both greater physical inter- experiences but also greater just almost almost like a por- becoming a portal into your home and and really bringing that that feeling that you get from being in a gym, that feeling that you get from being instructed, that feeling that you get um, when you're experiencing the, the fitness world outside of your home, uh, increasingly more and more realistic into the home, and uh, and so we're just you know we're just we're just watching that continue to evolve. Sure, I think a lot of points made there that that make the category so interesting. One of them being, as you mentioned previously, was just you know you have this equipment and you basically have to will yourself to get on it at home. And whether or not people did that, oftentimes we saw you know those machines, a treadmill, turn into you know a drying rack for clothes in the basement next to the laundry room. And whether or not people use them is debatable. And now it's it's a media company, it's a content company, it's a software company. There's there's coaching and all these this. Inter- interaction that goes into it. Um, I'm curious to know how you are thinking about the addressable market when you think about how big this could get. You know, there's, I think some surveys say there's 160 million gym memberships worldwide. Peloton has 3 million members and a fraction of those are actually connected fitness and the rest are digital subscribers. So, you know, quite a big opportunity there, but how do you quantify it? How big can this get? And, and kind of where's the ceiling if you want to think about it that way? Sure. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, well, I think, look, I, oh, sorry, Mike. No, no, go ahead, Michael. You take a cry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we're, we're a long way off from the ceiling. Um, mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, we, we, we've done some work in connected fitness and says even in the U.S. alone, right, that there, there's almost 10 million households that have both the, the financial means where the price points are today, uh, as well as um, as well as the desire for that type of experience. And so, you know, and that's just in the U.S. And, and, and frankly, what we've learned from Peloton is that market keeps expanding. Like we, we've been underestimating what that potential is. So that 10 million may be, may be understated. And, and so the ceiling, we think, is quite high. And I draw some of the analogies sometimes to, to streaming services, right? Because this is another, I think, a development that we're now beginning to get insight into is people owning multiple devices. And so in the same way that someone may pay a subscription for Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, and they're navigating concept, you know, content across all that, we're now seeing consumers that already have a Tonal and a Hydro and a Peloton. Or you, know, you can go look in the Facebook groups and see the Tonal Hydro community and the Hydro Peloton community. There's lots of combinations. And so 
you know, whatever we're estimating, I suspect right now we're underestimating it. And what we're estimating is there's a there's a large untapped opportunity that's out there. And John, I know you kind of had something there. Is there. Would you tack on to that at all? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I, I think Michael's exactly right. I mean, this is this is early innings, and if you look across, I mean, even if you just spend some of that time, I mean, Michael mentioned the Pelotonal Facebook pages and the and the Pella Hydro Facebook pages, and then just the individual sort of communities that exist around the likes of Hydro and Tonal. I mean, you if, if you go on one, you see this this incredible sort of attachment. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, part of this is what's the expanding universe of the users. And part of it is, you know, how how much use are individuals getting out of it, right? You know, how sticky is this, is, is this experience? And I think that, you know, both of those things, both early days from an adoption perspective, very, very early days from an adoption perspective in online, plus this incredible attachment to both the, 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 the device or the experience itself, but also the community that it's created. And, and again, if you, go on the, if you go on these community pages, I mean, you'll see it's a, it's a broad sort of swath of, of demographic, socio-demographic uh, graphic folks. And, uh, and, and, and oftentimes, as Michael noted, you, know, you will see multiple devices in, in, in the home um uh uh that the, the people are using so yeah i mean we think we think that there's you know we think that that's there, there's a lot of running room here i guess it's yeah and i yeah, there's an emotional there's an emotional aspect to this you know i think i don't even know the answer to this but i believe that when connected fitness was first dubbed as a term the connectivity was really viewed as as sort of the internet enabled right that you could have classes that were streamed into the home Connected now, uh, there's another aspect that really is the human connection. And there's a study uh, done at MIT that, that talked about when you have the sense of physical motion with someone else. And Hydro had done some of this work and you know, had leveraged some of this work even in the design of the product. That sense of moving with someone else and being in the same rhythm and seeing that on the screen creates, creates a real bond in, in the brain, right, that, that has a desire to come back and to do that again. And there's a real, there is a real connectivity. And I think that that emotional pull, and you get some of that in, in boutique fitness, right? We think that's one of the reasons boutique fitness, you know, you had that, that communal aspect, but that communal aspect that really has an emotional pull in addition to the physical pull is really playing out on the connected side now. And that's, and again, that creates a uh, real headroom for, for the category. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think I think as you look at that, you know, when you see, I mean, when, whenever you talk to somebody who's a hydro user or they're a, or they're a Peloton user, or that you, you know, they have this there's there's an attachment to the community, but there's also an attachment to the instructors, right, to the trainers, right. I mean, and that's just that's that's an that's another level of just attachment. And you know, you talk to people who have their fit, you know, have their favorite rower on on hydro or their favorite rowers. And they always want to get on to get on with them. And they and same with Peloton, right? Who, who's your favorite, you know, who's your favorite instructor on, on Peloton? And 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 then I think that as as the devices and 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 the hardware and the software are improving and becoming more and more intuitive. I mean, if you look at Tonal, and, and I don't know if folks have you know how many folks will have had the opportunity to explain uh, explore the sort of smart weight factors of, of Tonal, but it is really it's it's providing uh, it's providing a strength training experience that you that you I mean, you 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 definitely can't get in your home on your own. Nothing you could do could replicate the strength training uh, that you're getting from the smart device that is that is tonal. And and in some cases, it's doing stuff that you couldn't even do uh, if if you had a if you had a physical trainer standing right there with you, you know, kind of helping you manipulate uh, the, the weights and the like. So uh, so I think it's you know to Michael's point, like. You know, there's there's all these layers of connected fitness that are that are pulling deeper and deeper into the psyche of the consumer and 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 as a result folks are stick it's a very sticky experience but it's also a, an experience that you want to share right you want to tell other people about um so i think i think that's another reason why we see this sort of multiplier effect happening yeah i think tonal is uniquely positioned in the landscape, both around strength training and the technology and, and frankly, some of the patents that they have. Um, when you talk about their ability to deploy software updates, kind of like Tesla, that they can go back and analyze totally. things and, and update it. And then everybody benefits from that across the board. It's been really interesting to see. I enjoy talking with uh, Ali Arati on the podcast, but has this changed? It's something that's been so interesting, you know, 
thinking about the benefits of boutique fitness and, and our willingness to pay $40 a class maybe to go there for the amenities, for the experience with other people, but also to see those trainers that we, we've developed a relationship with and had a bond with. And now doing the same thing at home, like you said, with some of the Peloton or Hydro instructors, has this changed maybe our perception of community and that interaction that now we really didn't think we could not go to the studio, but maybe we can to the extent that it's replicating that relationship. And what does that say for boutique studios as we get back into, you know, post pandemic mode? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, one of the things we talk about is likening it a little bit to, to, to what's going on with meetings today. Right. I mean, I think, you know, zoom, you know, before the, you know, before the pandemic, right. You know, zoom, zoom, was rarely used, right? Rarely used. And now it's become a total way of life and we've figured out how to use it effectively and efficiently. And in some cases we found ways that it's actually way better than 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 what you have to do to have a physical encounter sometimes, right? When you think about the travel saved and the, the time saved and the efficiency there. That being said, right, we're all social animals. And and I'm sure all of us are, you know, are dying for that time when we no longer have to take such precautions that we've had to take during the pandemic and can go get together, you know, and can go gather and, and socialize and be together and in a much more normalized fashion. So I, I think, you know, it's interesting. I think that, or, you know, I think we think that, that looking at kind of connected fitness and boutique fitness, you know, they, they, they both play, you know, we believe, and hopefully they will, you know, continue uh, as the world, you know, hopefully starts to get back to normal. We'll play, uh, we'll both play an important role in, uh, in the fitness, in the fitness world, in the fitness space. And, and talking about this being potentially in the early days and it continuing to evolve so much upside, so much innovation yet to come. And the thing about all the companies that are already in that space, uh, when I mentioned to different operators and founders that I, I was having you guys on the show, one thing that came up over and over again is like, how can they invest in every company in the space, right? Is there, you know, <laughs> being being someone that in the past has gone out and raised venture capital, I've had investors tell me, you know, this is a conflict of interest. We we can't invest because we're in a similar company, we're in a similar space. It's like, how is it that you're managing to, you know, back these different companies? And what are those conversations like with maybe the different companies to say like information sharing, how does it stay confidential, et cetera? Yeah. Like it, it seems like we invest in a lot in the category, and, and we do to some extent, but it's but it's a small portion of the ones that exist. You know, to your point, there's a, there's an enormous number of companies that are that are competing in the sector, and and we seek to back the leading company in in each respective subsector. So it seems like every company in the space uh, that we're partnering with, because we've been we've been fortunate to partner with some great entrepreneurs and CEOs that that have that have been successful, and so they've. And they've had a high profile in the in the category, but the reality in our mind is it's it's a large fragmented market. Uh, it's fragmented by the consumer target, by price points, by exercise modalities, and you know, we have different internal teams where appropriate, as as you suggest. If there if we if there is some sensitivity amongst one of the companies, but candidly, you know, more typical is having these CEOs sharing lessons with each other, you know, that can be helpful to one another or seeking collaborations. And, and they value the broader perspective that we have on the sector. So it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been a material issue. And, and, but to the extent that someone's got that concern, uh, then we really do make sure that we've got a separate team that's focused on it and, uh, you know, and, and just creating a, a few more barriers to give them comfort that there's no information being shared uh, that they wouldn't want shared. So is it? Yeah, and I think all the. Oh, sorry, Joe. Go ahead. No, absolutely. Go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say, you know, and, and on the flip side, I think like if you, if you look across our portfolio and look beyond just sort of our fitness bit businesses, I mean, you'll see that we have you know, we have multiple investments in beauty and restaurants and pet in in lots of areas that we like that we that we think there's there's as Michael stated, kind of plenty of consumer demand, broad-based consumer demand, consumers all looking to engage with that category slightly different, maybe a little bit overlap and maybe 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 some differences. But we also find as, as advisors uh, to companies and, and, and folks in the category that the benefit of this, you know, the, the, the benefit of understand deeply understanding the category and having you know participated in it for years and, and having multiple touch points 
um, you know, the ability to share you know, non-confidential learnings and to, as Michael said, bring CEOs and founders together on a regular basis, knowing that they're struggling with the same things, have the same issues, you know, whether it be supply chain, whether it be performance marketing, whatever the challenge might be at the time. We just see a lot of value in, in, in sort of having some deep familiarity or expertise across the category. Yeah, and ultimately, I would add, I'd add, John, that we've got the same goals as the founders and CEO, right? So we're going to do everything in our ability to help them fulfill their vision for that business, and and certainly, you know, we're, we wouldn't want to do anything where we think that something else we've done that we've done is going to create an impediment to doing that. Sure, and, and as you look at this category, and, and speaking that, you know. Ultimately, all these companies are looking to return value for shareholders to some extent. And, you know, Peloton is riding high right now. Some of the other companies raising big rounds. Just how do they return that value in terms of the, like sustaining this category? Obviously, Lululemon came in and acquired Mir, which I think for a lot of people validated a lot of the things that we are seeing and thinking um, and presents a unique case going forward for that kind of overlap in retail. Um, but is there some, spe- there's been speculation just in conversations I've had, does somebody come in potentially and try to roll up this space? Does Peloton acquire some of these other, you know, equipment manufacturers? Doesn't look to be the case that they can do that type of product development innovation on their own, but just ultimately what happens as you think about the number of companies, the overlap, as you mentioned, one's targeting different price points, one specializing in different modalities, um, you know, how does that play out? And, and really, is there potential for some of these companies to maybe consolidate or roll up? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's a fascinating question. I mean, and look, we're 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 early days, right, in this category, as we said before. So, so the, the short answer is, yeah, I don't think we know, right? Um, but I think that I think that there are definitely a, a bunch of different paths in which this, you know, in which in which the category could evolve. You know, I mean, you can you can see folks continuing to go sort of best in class in a particular lane, and 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 have the consumer sort of evolve to that to that point of sort of saying, hey, you know, I want the best strength training device, I want the best rower, I want the best bike um, with the best content. So you know, you can see kind of a tr- you know a classic individual kind of best in class. You could also see that sort of you know uh, subscription consolidation, right? Uh, start to start to happen where where you where you see benefits of benefits of scale either from the consumer front right whether it's whether it's something that the consumer looks at and says you know I you know and, and starts to lead the lead the category and and talking about or lead the category in, in the desire for a consolidated subscription with potentially multiple hardware um, aspects to it so that you could you could you could kind of see that evolving in that way um, and and maybe that's you know, maybe that's something like a Peloton, you know, coming out with different devices. Maybe it's in some of the independent folks coming together collectively, or, or maybe it's, you know, or maybe it's one of the bigger players in the space, um, you know, acquiring or consolidating, um, consolidating some of the, some of the smaller players. And then there's a, you know, there's a, there's a whole kind of third piece, which, which, or maybe fourth piece, I don't know how many numbers I'm on right now, but, um, but the, the, you kind of alluded to with, with Lululemon, right. Which is, you know, there, there are folks out there in the, in that the play tangentially in the space, in the active work space, the Lululemon, the Nikes, et cetera, which can build, which, you know, they can build strategic plans around, uh, around connected fitness. I mean, you, you look, you know, you look at things like Apple, I mean, you look at companies like Apple or Amazon, Right, these 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 massive um, sort of technology platforms that that would also seem to be pretty interesting uh, consolidators for some of the stuff that's going on. So, so I, I think we look at it like this, which is we think there's a ton of opportunity. As we said, there's it's, it's early days, so we think the category is continue going to continue to grow, which is going to allow these individual companies space to grow as they as as that category expands and as the white space increases. So to speak, and and really, what we're focused on, I'd say, right now is you know we're obviously thinking about all these things, and and these are key topics in boardrooms, and 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 I think across the connected fitness space, um, you know, investors and 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 board members are thinking hard about this, and 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 talking to their companies about it. But but really, where we want to be right now is we want to be with the best in class players in these spaces, 
Um, and if we have the best in class players that are always leading, if we look at tonal leading in strength, um, strength training, if we look at hydro leading in, in, uh, in connected rowing, you know, we want to back those great brands, great offerings with these compelling, uh, and visionary CEOs like, like Ali and Bruce. And, and, and we think that no matter how the, the industry evolves, you know, we'll be, you know, we'll be partnered with, with, with the winners. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, but it's certainly early days. And I think there's a lot of different ways and, and maybe multiple ways that, that the category will eventually evolve um, as it grows. Yeah. And what I would add, and John touched on this, right. And you, and you touched on it with Lululemon coming into the category. I will say that we are, we are receiving more interest and hearing more interest from parties that aren't in the category today, but they see Peloton success, some of whom don't love the idea in that case of seating a room in the house, right? That, that where they feel like, okay, is that a relationship or, that I need to have and I don't have? Uh, and you could think of some of the parties that John mentioned that certainly fit into that camp. But there's also this opportunity just to bring the wrapper around the whole consumer experience. So you know, one of the one of the things that ClassPass did for boutique fitness is it let that consumer jump around from concept to concept, but still have a single a single interface with ClassPass. And you know, I do think that there's an opportunity for someone and who it is and what it looks like to create this to create a, a wrapper around whatever your personal fitness experience is. And sometimes that may be connected, and sometimes it may be at the studio, and sometimes it may be at the gym. But how do I how do I help you navigate that? That that would speak to the fact that there's someone that that may seek to consolidate uh, and may may own some of the assets or or may just may be the interface across them. Yeah, I think I agree first and foremost. But I think potentially the other thing that we're seeing as well in a company that we've uh, had on the podcast and followed is Future, who's doing this from like a coaching perspective where it's like mm -hmm. your personal health coach that's yep. following you along. So yep. if you want to work out, connected fitness, studio, go for a run or traveling, they can help you navigate all that kind of to your point, maybe in a different way than, than uh, putting a wrapper around all of it, but certainly playing a piece of it. And I think that's one potential area that we're not talking about as much right now, which is like, what is the one-to-one -one coach experience, health coach, nutrition coach, fitness coach, um, that potentially plays a piece in this, whether it's individually as part of, or as part of one of these companies, I think that will be interesting to follow as well. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And I think, I think touching, touching on that, right. And, and we didn't, we, I mean, or, or on that, which we didn't really touch on, which is, you know, it'll be interesting to watch evolve, you know, are these, are these closed loop experiences, right? Is it a closed loop experience where, you know, like Peloton, where everything is, is rolled up into the Peloton instructors and, and all the contents created by that, that particular company and that relationship exists in, in sort of in that closed loop, or are we going to see sort of, you know, an, an abundance of open platform, um, open platform, uh, uh, offerings, which, you know, to Michael's point may or may not end up being co actual consolidations, but may have partnerships with groups like Joe, like future or, 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 or some of the larger, more, you know, more established gyms or other, or other ways that trainers can be on and off the device with the, with the consumer. So that sort of closed loop versus open loop or, 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 or open system will be an interesting evolution as well. Watching that evolution will be interesting as well. Sure. And I don't want to get too far into the weeds on the connected fitness piece, but, um, I think in the U.S. we we might not be following this closely, but I think Techno Gym is in, from Italy is trying to do this a little bit with huh? opening up the pipes, letting different providers in terms of content yep. instructors get in there, and they already have you know thousands, tens of thousands of commercial um, units where they have their equipment, and also going into the home. So certainly, yeah, very interesting there. Um, yep. Pivoting just a little bit as we, we zoom out and, and get towards the end of the conversation here, um, beyond fitness, you alluded to this at the beginning of the conversation, the other maybe verticals or categories beyond fitness, specifically nutrition, wellness, supplements. Um, what are you keeping an eye on and, and what maybe companies or areas are you focused on and interested in? Well, as John mentioned earlier, there's some areas that we already have invested in, right, in the active wear and the supplements and, and sports nutrition and the like. Uh, but the, looking forward, we're spending a lot of time, what we just talked about, personalization, right? How do I have uh, experiences that are more more tailored? And that tends to be uh, bringing real 
either algorithms or machine learning to the experience that could be on the nutrition side or the fitness side, spending a lot of time around science backed uh, nutrition and science backed supplements, which is, I guess, another way of just saying it's efficacious or that we can feel confident in the efficacy of it. And that's, you know, everything from endurance to blood flow or, you know, or, or just being active longer. You know, one thing we didn't talk about is that so much of uh, so many of these products have appealed to a younger demographic and a younger demographic really helped spur the success in boutique fitness. But what we're also seeing is just that desire for individuals to stay active longer, right? And so we're, we're looking at a lot on that, on that later uh, end of the age spectrum and hopefully, hopefully not a reflection of, 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 of John and my own aging, but you know, kind of trying to stay healthy and active longer. So that's an active area. And then, and then wellness, uh, and it's, it's such a broad term, but, but it's broad in part because you know, we see consumers thinking about their wellness more holistically. And whether that's relaxation or, or better sleep, and you know, we were talking earlier, I know about uh, before we you know, started, the, started the podcast here around sleep being a, you know, another category that's really evolving and technology being brought to that. So you know, we're, looking at, we're looking at all those areas pretty holistically. And then again, concepts that try and pull all that together for a consumer so that they can manage their overall, their overall fitness. Yeah, I think collectively it's played and is playing such a, a bigger part in our lives when we think about well-being and the, the broad definition of wellness. You know, now I think the most recent estimate of a $4.5 trillion industry, so no shortage of opportunities. Um, the last thing as we wrap up, I, I wanted to get your opinion on this because it does come up a lot. And, you know, as, as someone who thinks about you know, how do you increase access? That's one of the, the words that we hear a lot about, connected fitness, um, some of the kind of lower priced uh, entry level gyms, you, increasing access. Obviously, we, we have a healthcare issue with respect to sedentary lifestyles, maybe people not exercising as much as they could or should or eating the things that they could and, and really having a hard time making those decisions and sticking to it. So like, as this wellness or connected fitness uh, categories grow, that relating to like actual outcomes on the health side. Um, how do you think about that kind of disparity and, and really how we go about connecting the dots from like this being such a big, massive consumer category, the money being poured into it, and maybe some of the things with like getting people healthier on the other side? Yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, that's it's, it's, it's a great question. And I think that, you know, as, as Michael kind of alluded to, there's very much of a holistic nature through all of this, right? And I think that that what's exciting about both, as we think about the categories, these, these sort of broad health and wellness categories, um, we think about them as sort of individually and collectively. And I think that increasingly being able to think about them collectively is something that's new in our world. I think historically, you know, these th things were looked at very individually. You know, there was sort of you had a diet or you had a diet program or or you were someone that worked out or, 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 or you, you, know, you did some sort of workout. You were maybe someone that, 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 that uh, practiced mindfulness or that, that had a particular, you know, particular way of, of you know, looking after your own mental well-being, which as we know, going back to Michael's early response a second ago, I mean, you know, this whole continuum from physical through emotional to psychological and the mental uh, mental health uh, is, is, is an area that we're spending a lot of time on. And so, so I think there's a couple of things here. So, so um, you know, we do obviously continue to have, you know, a, a significant problem with obesity, um, with heart disease, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, it's not been the, not been, not been a panacea yet by any means, but I think one, as we watch sort of the engagement, I, mean, I think what's amazing about things like connected fitness, what's amazing about things like boutique fitness, you know, it just, it's created a, it's created a bunch of, and we've talked about this throughout the podcast today. It's created a bunch of different hooks, right. That keep people coming back, right. That keep people, that keep people on, on it. Um, and whether it's getting addicted to your particular instructor and you love that instructor and you want to work out with them every other day, or whether it's the amazing technology from, 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 from tonal, or whether it's the, or whether it's the experience you have, you know, the community you feel when you, when you go to a, you know, a core power yoga class, right? It's, I think there's, we're, the, the category is evolving and becoming better and better, and it's becoming more and more engaging in more and more points in our lives. And in addition, I think there's the, the, you know, so individually and collectively. And I think now 
you're starting to see, I mean, we love this idea, as Michael alluded to, of this sort of continuum of engagement um, in your lives, whether, you know, and, and, it, and it has to do with nutrition. It has to do with sleep. It has to do with, with exercise. It has to do with mental well-being. And I think increasingly you're seeing consumers able to, through, the, through technology, really through technology probably is the, is the biggest driver here, able to connect those and intertwine them in their lives in a habit-forming way that's, that's never really happened before. And, and then, so I would say that kind of on a broad holistic, and hopefully I'm not being too Pollyannish about the impact that that can have. Um, and then also I think as we watch sort of Gen Z and uh, and you know, you know millennials and you know kind of Gen Z through millennials. I mean, the focus you know they just they they've grown up in a world where you turn you know you pick up a bar or you pick up a drink and you turn it over and you look at the ingredients. Like you think about how much sugar is in something, right? You 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 wonder whether there's enough protein in that for for the day. And and what has been I think for 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 for, for those of us and Michael and my generation an evolution to that focus on healthfulness. Um, I think that, 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 that the Gen Z and the millennials, it's just a part of their normal well, you know, normal being, normal well-being. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, those generations will carry this forward and hopefully, you know, the older generations will, will, will evolve to it as well. And, you know, I think technology, connected fitness, improvements in petite fitness, all of these things will play big roles. Yeah, I'm certainly hopeful and excited about that future. You know, all the opportunity, the technology, the personalization, a lot of the things that we've talked about here today. I think uh, it's pretty obvious from this conversation. We could we could probably talk about it for a few more hours just with all the things that are <laughs> happening. Um, but I know we'll get you guys out of here. And, and just wondering as we wrap up, um, if listeners were interested in learning more, potentially getting in touch, what, what's the best way to follow maybe you or Al Catterton in general? Honestly, the best is probably just through through our website, through uh, the letter L, Catterton, uh, Catterton.com. Uh, we try and keep that up to date with some of our thinking and, and some of the research we're doing and our areas of focus, and, and also a great way to learn around some of the individual portfolio companies. Um, and that, that's probably the most, uh, the most comprehensive. Perfect. We'll, we'll send folks there. And listen, just overall grateful for the time today and excited to share this conversation with listeners. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, it's great to be on. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.